Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to this STL Partners uh, webinar. It's a follow up from our earlier one on coronavirus and the impact on the telecoms market. So uh, good afternoon to everyone in Asia. Good morning to everyone in North America. And thanks very much for joining us today. So before we get into the content, I will just give you a bit of housekeeping on what's happening for the day. Um, so this will be a, an hour's webinar where we'll do uh, hopefully about 40 minutes of presenting and paneling with our guests uh, and then open up to questions for you. All of you guys are in listen only mode, so you can't speak to us, but you can use the chat box uh, to submit questions um, all throughout uh, the presentation, whenever you think of them, and to let me know of any technical difficulties and I will try and resolve those if I can. Um, it is a lie that you can download our COVID report in the handouts this time. I'm really sorry, I forgot to take that bullet out of the slide. I have not uploaded that PDF, but following the, the webinar, we will be sharing a recording and the slides, and that'll be sent out to you in an email tomorrow. So um, I think that's it for housekeeping. Uh, and now we will move on to the content. So today, uh, there are five of us on the webinar. Uh, myself, Amy Cameron, I am a senior analyst at STL Partners. And I will be the moderator uh, for today's panel, asking the questions, keeping everyone on time. Apologies if I cut you off if you're talking too much. Um, and with us, we have some guests. So first, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Reiner Deutschman. I'll let you introduce yourself. Do you want to say a couple of words? Yes, hello everyone. Uh, thanks Amy and uh, team to have me back. It's the second time for me, what an honor. So um, I'm a group operating officer in uh, Dialogue Axiata, which is the uh, Sri Lankan operation of Axiata Group. Uh, we run a fairly large uh, set of businesses as part of the group um, across uh, mobile, fixed, fixed wireless and fiber, TV, pay TV, um, uh, both on the retail side as well as on the enterprise side. We are running uh, data center operations, we are running um, uh, enterprise services, we are running wholesale, subsea cables. Um, we also invested in financial services. We have acquired a bank and uh, developing a fintech uh, a business. So we are fairly broad, even though maybe not the smallest country in the world, but a very uh, broad set of operations. So I'm very happy to be here and share a couple of experiences. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for joining us. And as well, we have from Verizon Wireless, Dr. Sukant Mohapatra. So I will let you introduce yourself as well, please. Oh, hi. Good morning. Uh, good evening, wherever you are. <laughs> uh, actually, myself, Sukant Mohapatra. I work in uh, enterprise innovation and 5G solution at Verizon. Uh, prior to Verizon, I worked at uh, Ericsson and Bell Labs. Uh, over 25 years, I've been in telecommunication industry, working in wireline, wireline as well as wireless technology, uh, spanning from applied research, uh, technology strategy, and business development. And uh, I live in New Jersey. I'm a senior member of IEEE and I live in New Jersey with my family. Great. Thank you very much. So we look very much forward to hearing your guys' experiences from your respective operators. Um, during this webinar. So next up, uh, we have Andrew Collinson, who is the Research Director at STL Partners. Hi, Andrew. Hello, guys. Yeah, I'm Andrew. As you can see, I'm practicing growing a kind of uh, lockdown beard in the beard growing competition in STL Partners. Uh, you can see who I am. So, And also, you can, you can now see through the thin disguise of the suit and the glasses. And uh, I was just thinking how funny it is to see us, our real faces up against our pictures. That's uh, great. So thanks, Amy. Excellent. And finally, Dean Bubbly, who um, works with STL running the Network Enterprise, um, I mean, Network Futures stream, and also uh, independently in disruptive analysis. So, Dean? Thanks, Amy. Yeah, hi, uh, Dean Bubbly. And uh, yeah, I've uh, been an analyst of varying stripes for about 25 years and uh, mostly focus on networks, but also I get to do some of the the fun long-term futurism and horizon scanning stuff as well. 
Super. Okay, so that's everyone. Hopefully, uh, you now got the faces and names all matched up, and you'll know who's talking when when we're having a little bit of a panel discussion throughout the the session. So, a little bit of the agenda for the day. Um, we will start with uh, presenting some of the results from a survey that we've been running and which I think we have shared with all of you guys attending today about how telco's priorities are changing in response to COVID-19. Um, after that, we'll, run, we'll go through some long-term scenarios for 2025 uh, with Dean, and then we'll open up to Q&As. So we're going to uh, be doing some lots of discussion with the, 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 our guests throughout um, the panel as well. So you won't just be hearing from, from one of us. So that's it. And without, uh, finally, uh, just a little bit of context is that um, we published a report looking at um, the impact of COVID-19 uh, for telecom in March. And we did a, our first webinar in April, and that was, uh, as, as Reiner said, it was with Reiner as well as um, someone from Elisa. Uh, and now we're doing some follow-up uh, with this webinar, and it will be ongoing um, because obviously this is going to be affecting us for quite a while. So with that context, I will hand over to Andrew. Thanks, Amy. Um, so I think we'll just like to kind of we summarize is what did we say last time? We said it's the long-term disruption and uh, that may seem obvious now. It wasn't quite so obvious back in March, so I'm quite pleased uh, we at least got that right. And um, wh what we also saw back in March was we saw how quickly telcos were starting to do some good stuff. So back then we were talking about some of the offers um, and responses. We're not talking about that so much today. We're talking more about uh, the midterm, the next few months really. We also said it will accelerate coordination age trends and we'll talk a little bit more about that. A lot of what we'll talk about, I think, relates to this discussion. And possibly as part of that, it may make 5G spending more cautious. And I think that's one of the things we're going to talk a lot about uh, in the next few slides, because it's one of the big areas, I think, of contention. We also said that telco should focus on customer needs. And again, we'll look at people's views on that and uh, that there was an opportunity to use the experience that everyone's had of making changes in this time to think about how do we change things more quickly because we know we, we need to do that. So I think that's what we said last time and what we're doing this time is I was thinking about well what what is going to change in the near term so I was thinking not so much right here and right now but the next few months um, and I thought the best way of doing that actually would be to talk to a few people. And then I realized I couldn't talk to enough people, so I thought I'll do an online survey. Uh, online surveys are a pretty cruel to, crude tool, but um, we've managed to get quite a good set of responses from about 167 people. That was up to 1 p.m. UK time. I had a quick look. I've had about 30 or so more since then. So if you put your input between now and uh, about two hours ago, as I'm sorry, we weren't quite able to juggle the charts around, but we will do that for the final paper. Um, and what we've got, who, who responded? So you can see there's about 40% telcos, 30% vendors, and 30% other folk. Um, and uh, sample wise, it's very biased towards Europe and Americas, although recently I've had a bit more input from the Asia Pacific region and MENA, and I'd like to obviously get the sample up a little bit there. Um, if we can just page forward. So it's actually quite a senior level sample, 10% uh, C level getting sea level people to do a survey thank you very much uh, everyone frankly who's done it because i know that it takes your time um, but it is it is quite a senior level survey and you can see a, a range of role types here from you know so management i would cast someone like reiner is, as being in management because he's a coo he's got a broad set of responsibilities and i did this by hand so i've gone through everybody that i knew in that list and tried to work out what they did um, analytical would be someone like me or Dean or Amy, who's in consultants and also heads of market intelligence. Strategy does what it says on the tin. Business development includes marketing and sales types and product. I've included technology and some business head type people in there, you know, who, who are addressing specific parts of the market so that you're not looking at a sort of too many multiple uh, shades of color in one chart. Before we go into the re report, the results, what I want to say is, you know, how should you think about the, re the results? Um, so the way I think about them, this is a bit like a sentiment survey that you sometimes see uh, coming out in the marketplace where you say, what are people in the industry 
think is going to happen. Now, some of them know what is going to happen because a few of them, you know, on the boards or sea level people or, or you know, are in the know of decisions uh, that are being made or being said. Um, obviously, not going to reveal any of that, and I very much doubt that the people who answered it would have put in uh, anything that was um, proprietary or, or, or confidential in that regard. Other people hope, other people wish, other people think. Um, having said that, what I think I've seen looking at the results, and we're not going to go into this level of detail, is actually a remarkable level of consistency in, in the distribution of answers. So what you're going to see are spreads of answers about whether we think one thing is more likely or another to go in a positive or a negative direction. And so really what we're talking about is not that this thing is going to happen in the whole market. We're talking about a distribution of how people are thinking about it. And so when I say it's consistent, what I mean is there isn't a lot of difference in the answers or in the spread of answers I've seen from operators and vendors, for example. They've, they've broadly said the same things. Um, and one of the reasons it's useful to ask people you know, who they work for, I mean, we can tell that anyway, obviously, to some extent, is to understand if people are trying to influence the result to make you one thing, one thing or another. And I would say that's really not particularly evident. You know, maybe some people have tried to do that, but I, I really don't think that's what we're seeing. So I think it's, it's interesting with 160 odd people, you know, not talking about the whole world. And obviously, we can see there's a bit of a skew in the sample towards uh, Europe and Americas. But it's pretty, you know, I, I feel there is a consistency in the answers that makes me sense that there's there's value in them and it's not just a kind of straw poll as it were so if we come on to some of the answers here um the first area we're going to cover or um we asked in five different areas and so this area is about technology so by technology here what i meant was the sort of general technologies that are being used to um change the way operators are working so you can see here five things automation um intelligence and analytics telco edge, cloudification, which we split into two, part about being core systems and part about network cloud. The way I interpret these results is that if you look at the edge um, cloudification and network cloud, and this also relates to the comments that I've seen from these, then what you're seeing here is about 20 to 30% saying, we think there might be a minor delay or cut in that, and a very small proportion saying there'll be a major cut in that. You're also seeing 20 to 30% saying, we think there'll be an acceleration in this, or um, and slightly more saying we think we'll see a major acceleration in this. What that also means is that there's 30 odd percent in the middle who are saying we don't think much change is likely. And I think the way I would read this chart is to say actually that's broadly the case. Is most people are saying yeah nothing's really changed in this space yet, but in some places there are there are reasons to push it forward, and in other places there are reasons to push it back. Whereas I think with artificial intelligence and automation, and particularly automation, you're seeing a much more a much less nuanced and strong drive towards saying, yeah, automation is a priority. You've got over 60, nearly 70% of people giving you a positive answer about saying, yes, it's going to be accelerated or uplift. And, you know, 10% or thereabouts saying, no, we think it might be delayed and the rest saying we don't know. So it's not many saying we don't know or, or not likely. We're saying sort of quite so. So I would say the first finding of this is that automation, and you might also say, well, actually, that's pretty obvious, but it's also quite, um, it's also quite, um, comforting as a research director to see the obvious come out in your answers because it's also very interesting when it doesn't but here I think it's saying actually this is an area that is hot right now and is hot for the next few months uh, and beyond I think automation I think more generally uh, because of the drive for people not to be touching things broadly but also to take people out of operational environments all the things that you would expect um, from something like a pandemic so Amy I'm going to pass it the, the buck back to you here yeah, so I think that, you know, just going into a bit more detail of what we've heard on the automation side through our conversations is, you know, as Andrew says, it's really just adding urgency to lots of stuff that was already underway and the operators that um, were further down the automation path are benefiting more from it um, already, you know. So I think there's uh, many short term ones that are very network focused. So if we look here, you know, in terms of optimizing the network to handle different traffic patterns because you know people are in different uh, parts of different geographies or using different types of services and you know trying to automate uh, network optimization for that um, becoming more predictive and efficient about field workforce and that's especially you know dealing with staff shortages 
Um, but again, that's an area where telcos have already been trying to reduce truck rolls um, and sending out field technicians unnecessarily, so they're accelerating that. And then there are some things that are, you know, responding to COVID-19 induced challenges and opportunities, and that might be more specifically around understanding um, sort of uh, bad debt, bad debt analytics, or um, trying to do, you know, population level analysis, or you know, things things like that. So those are more network focused. And then obviously there's the whole customer angle where it's all trying, you know, accelerating the shift to digital sales channels because people can't go out to retail stores. Um, and automated customer care because they can't get people in their call centers. Um, and, you know, people may have seen uh, the announcement from AT&T about trying to, uh, you know, cut $6 billion of costs and a lot of that coming out of things like self-installation of solutions. So those are a lot of the short-term things that we're seeing. And these really feed into long-term goals, which I think are unchanged, but may be um, accelerated with increased priority investment and in automation. And that's um, around closing the loop on as, as many processes as possible. And that might be sort of in, in network operations as well as on service provisioning and, and, and sales to customers. And, and another interesting one that I've heard is, is thinking, making sure that all the automation efforts that telcos have done so far are not disrupted when they move to 5G, which is you know, what happens sometimes when you move to a new network um, equipment, you have to then re-automate some processes that were automated on the old network and to not have that sort of step back with 5G. And then finally, to, to make sure that, that the usage of automation tools and you know, AI as well are become more part of the everyday process for all employees. So that's kind of what I've heard, but I think um, at this stage, I'd like to hand over to Rainer and Sukant to hear a little bit from, from your experience of um, whether these chime with where you're seeing automation efforts or where you think that either in your internal operations or in demand from customers, um, you see real, real opportunity for operators. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Um, so if I can start and uh, Sukant, you can just, uh, Add to uh, add to it. Um, clearly, uh, I think we can all observe that the crisis uh, is kind of a catalyst for uh, automation and digitization. Um, probably all of us we had targets in terms of um, what kind of uh, KPIs we wanted to achieve by the end of the year, uh, and uh, I would assume, like us, that uh, we would have achieved those targets already now. Uh, way ahead of time and maybe overachieved. Uh, those KPIs can range from uh, uh, digital onboarding, can range from digital payment, can range from anything that is basically uh, on the roadmap of everyone's mind already implemented in terms of um, uh, uh, automation. The um, uh, second part, uh, whether you have the process in place or not, really is about the adoption. So how can how can uh, how can we increase the adoption of all the digital um, tools and the transformative tools um, in the customer base? And again, that has um, to some extent for those um, regions in the world which have a bit of a tighter lockdown, uh, such as uh, ourselves here in Sri Lanka, led to kind of a forced migration and adoption of some of the um, automation uh, tools that we have been providing um, earlier. So if I go through uh, some areas that, that we feel are quite key, um, the first one is obviously the customer automation, customer um, the customer processes where from an onboarding to a care, to a payment, um, to an in-life management, pretty much everything is now uh, in place. And um, onboarding means obviously a complete paperless onboarding. Uh, you, you don't want to have any any signature, any paper. You do a complete EKYC. Um, we have done this uh, since quite a while uh, and there's 100% uh, paperless onboarding. Um, also, I think what people are looking into, and we have also implemented, is a complete self-activation. So you don't need, you don't have to do anything in terms of, um, uh, again, going to some retailer. You can just uh, obtain a SIM uh, uh, by postal mail, for example, or get it from from some location, and you do a complete self-activation. Needless to say, that this is anyways facilitated by eSIM, which uh, we are now seeing more and more finally coming in, which is making the whole thing extremely seamless. Uh, on the care side, again, um, here the adoption of everyone's self-care application, I think, is is key. Um, we see huge, uh, huge leverage. Um, pretty much every single use case that the customer wants to do, 
uh, we are supporting on our self-care application, which is adopted widely now. Um, that has uh, all the normal stuff like bill payment and uh, buying of VAS, but um, more funky stuff like, for example, a single click pre to post paid migration. There's nothing else than just clicking a button and then you, you are going to be from a prepaid to a postpaid customer. So those things can be done. Um, on the payment side, again, uh, there is an adoption need to make sure that nobody really handles cash anymore. Um, in our country here, we are uh, not yet where maybe China and some of the other markets are in terms of a digital adoption for cash. Um, but it's getting there, um, having um, a debit card, having credit card, having the bank account linked to the self-care for payment uh, and for reloads. And then, uh, of course, the whole support side uh, where we see now bots becoming quite uh, uh, demanded by the customer. So it, it used to be maybe a bit of a nuisance, but we see that uh, the success of, of a bot support is, is quite large. The NPS that we see on the bots is uh, uh, quite, uh, quite quite good. And um, even we recently launched uh, the WhatsApp um, but on uh, vernacular language in, in Sinhala, which is not a very widely spoken language. I'm still not very fluent, but uh, even we have uh, Sinhala now uh, in, in, um, in, in the WhatsApp bot, which is fairly cool and the adoption is amazing. So that's the one side. Second side quickly is on the retailer side. Um, so here, uh, obviously there's a full digitization ongoing as well. Uh, we see uh, in, in Sri Lanka, we see also, if you want to read in India, um, the point of sale systems are being implemented, not only for telco services, but much beyond. So we will see an augmentation of the retailers to become a much more multi-versatile business support um, agent in the in, in the field, which can do much more than just one single business, uh, all based on a, on, a, on a digital platform. Um, network and IT automation, not talking much about it. That's a huge field. Again, uh, one, one of the things uh, here is uh, using video and using augmented reality. So we are using augmented reality, for example, for uh, alignment of satellite uh, TV dishes. So there's a lower skill needed now in the field as compared to earlier where you have to have experts to even um, make sure that you have a, a dish alignment. Uh, we have video calls down to the field for so you can you can actually do this uh, through um, a lower skilled person or even the customer himself. And then there's a huge area of back office automation, which obviously, again, is a huge field by itself, which delivers real, real big value in terms of uh, cost, uh, uh, in terms of um, quality and in terms of uh, handling times. All of this last sentence uh, wrapped up by uh, analytics. So once you have a digitization and automation, then the analytics really kicks in, which makes the whole thing very exciting and then boosts you into the next level of um, you know, performance. Mm. Thank you, Reiner. Thanks very much for all those lo loads of good examples there. I think, Sukanta, could you tell us a little bit more about you know, how yeah. you see this in the enterprise and long-term aspects, since, since I know that's an area that you look at a lot? Yes. So, so if you look into the short term as well, long term, the two aspects, one the telco point of view, another from the enterprise customer point of view. But if you look into the telco side, as you said very clearly, network optimization to handle the traffic pattern and load, we have seen actually in the network 1200% spike in the network traffic. And we have seen some of the like uh, text message, call, like uh, kind of like a what you see during New Year or New Year Day or Mother's Day, we can we have seen those kind of a, kind of a surge in traffic. How to handle those things? So network optimization is very key, and uh, network virtualization, SDN, NFP are very key to make the automation so that you can move the uh, different resource and uh, uh, routing as appropriate. So network become like self optimizing, self organizing based on the traffic flow. And those are paying off the SDN, NFP, those kind of technology and network virtualization are really paying off to do that. And more and more we'll see moving into that direction in the long term. But also the long term, what we'll see, particularly in the 5G, it is not just about the traffic load, about the different quality of service. Suppose some services, you need very high performance, high quality. Then with the network slicing in 5G, you can dedicate the network resource to meet the demanding performance and those kind of things. Uh, so far, as you said very clearly, though, though COVID-19 brought a lot of challenges, it brought a lot of opportunity. So for example, we at Telco can like uh, have a service called workplace as services, where you can do, let's say broadband connectivity, the VPN, as well as the conferencing, can be bundled as one service, can be uh, like sold as the service. So that brings a lot of opportunity. 
So this is from the telco point of view, but if you look into the particularly customer point of view in the enterprise segment or business segment, more and more is needed how we can do remote operation, how you can do predictive maintenance of the, uh, the what about in the industry operation point of view. So those are becoming more and more prevalent and we'll be seeing application of AI, machine learning and AR, VR, not only the communication infrastructure, but the application which will be riding on the 5G or high, high speed broadband. So those kind of things will be helping, let's say predictive maintenance in the industry. Uh, those kind of things will be more and more useful along with the communication infrastructure and various application to bring the automation in the, uh, particularly in the business customer side. Mm. Great, thank you. I think that's, you know, the, the enterprise applications part is very interesting. We'll be coming back to that in more detail later. So thank you guys, um, you know, for the discussion around automation. And now I will hand over to Andrew to uh, move on to another part of our uh, survey. Andrew? Sure, yeah, I'm gonna, I think we need to kind of whip through this because we've got a lot to cover. So one of the most contentious areas I think is the 5G mobile access network. And I think I shared with a lot of folk the, uh, a version of this slide before. So you can see one, of, and this is one of the areas where the, the orange bar to the left is really big. So people saying they think there's going to be a minor delay or cut. And I think my take on it is it, it's, um, it's first of all, there is a divergence. So there are, just because there are people on the left hand side doesn't mean there are not people on the right hand side. And there are people who are going to accelerate this. And I'm, I'm aware of a couple, for example, Telstra, I know has pulled forward some of its network investments. So I think it's important to think about it in the context that any given operator is in. This is not like a carte blanche to say something is going to go slower or faster. So different operators are going to take different stances on this. And if they're in the midway through stuff and the market is well prepared for it, then they may well not be pulling it back. Um, I think you're also seeing something here in terms of there was in any case a bit of a, a divergence between say Europe and America and China in the sense that America and China is you know, pretty pretty vociferously going forward and also South Korea um, towards 5G and Europe has been dragging its feet a bit and other parts of the world as well because maybe the economics aren't quite as desirable and they're in a slightly different part of the, the capital um, investment cycle. So I'm not looking at that and thinking, oh dear, 5G is off. What I think this is, is a bit more polarization in the existing 5G position and also very different positions in different operators. Um, and that kind of reflects what I've heard generally from people, but I'm going to pass this back to Amy and the rest of the team. Well, I think I'm going to, you know, first hand over to you, Sukanto, because, I mean, Verizon is a very vocal proponent of 5G, you know, for several years have said, you know, we're going, we're going ahead with this. Um, and so I'd like to get your your perspective on 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 what the outlook is for 5G and how COVID is is changing it from your from your opinion. I, I think uh, in the 5G, like um, it has uh, from the uh, particularly from the US and China, I think that nothing is going to change. I think it will go as it is planned. Maybe other part of the country might be a different situation because of the finance and other kind of things. But so far as US China is concerned, I believe the 5G has, uh, will go forward as it is. And more and more, it is becoming more critical because the type of situation or huge case we see. I'll give a very simple example. Uh, for example, today in US, 18 million people don't have broadband connectivity. But how we provide broadband connectivity, more and more people will be working from home and those kind of situation. How we provide the broadband connectivity to those people? Uh, for example, like a rural America, it is very, it's not very cost effective to lay the fiber to the houses because which are far apart. But the fixed wireless access could be another potential option where economically we can provide high speed broadband to the people. So, so the application of the uh, kind of a different fixed wireless well access and uh, other other kind of technology will be more useful given the kind of situation we see in the COVID-19. So more and more people can work from home and uh, different kind of work they can support remotely. Uh, and similarly, if you look into the industry segment, right? Uh, 
So we're looking more automation. We're looking more productivity increase, how you can do remote operation in the industry itself. So private 5G, private LT, those kind of big uh, technology become more re relevant actually. And in Europe, there is a lot of uh, focus on to put on the private 5G and private LTE, but so far as the uh, like 5G it itself is concerned, uh, we see this will going forward as it is planned, and also in the future it will be more and more used. Particularly, like for example, if you look into education sector, if you want to provide the the kind of a connectivity to the all people with kind of a uh, AR, VR kind of technology. 5G only leave the, uh, the path forward, provide the high speed connectivity to support those application, not just the connectivity point of view, what application, what platform will be using so that it can effectively used for the education, effectively can be used in the industry, those kind of things. So we see the 5G is a path forward and um, we'll have a much yeah. uh, bigger future. Uh, I guess. Yeah, Dean, go ahead. I'll, I'll jump in with a couple of things. I mean, I'll talk about the long term trends and 5G later on. But in terms of the short term, I think we have to sort of base our expectation relative to what we would have been saying on a webinar in May had the pandemic not occurred. And I think that there are some possible accelerants in some places but i think there's also a few near-term breaks and so here it depends a bit on which country and which operator we're talking about but certainly around the world there have been a few instances where regulators have delayed spectrum auctions or awards for example we're seeing certain amount of delay in getting the next version of the 3GPP standards uh, release 16 finalized and there's also sort of various sort of bureaucratic or local difficulties about things like network build out you can't go and get permits for a new cell tower if the town hall is closed and the working from home in the local government isn't as efficient as it might be in the tech sector and i think also we there's some question marks around uh, adoption and devices we've seen possibly the um, the next version of the iphone um, pushed out a little bit because of perhaps supply chain issues um, and, and there's an open question about how many people are really going to want to spend a thousand bucks on a device upgrade anytime soon i think the longer term stuff gets very interesting and there's some stuff i've been looking at recently as to sort of whether as well as the pandemic you also have geopolitics raising its head perhaps with you know bifurcation of 5g in the sort of release 17 time frame between a sort of a north american view or a chinese view or a european view but that i can maybe I'll talk about a bit later so my, my view on the, in the short term is some operators will be keeping their 5g uh, programs uh, on track. Some will have to slow them down because of mostly external factors. And then things like fixed wireless access, that was always going to grow. I'm not sure it's now going to grow even more or faster than I would have said, you know, three months ago. I mean, I think that's the question about fixed wireless access is one thing, does it have to be 5G? And I think now is, the, you know, the chance for Reiner to, to talk about his market where the 5G question might be less important it's more a question of, of fixed versus mobile um and and, yeah. and balancing those needs correct so um obviously the um the need for jumping into 5g earlier depends a bit on the current position on your 4g uh spectrum and built out um, and especially it also depends on uh, some of the countries have integrated licenses some of the countries have uh, differentiated license between fixed and mobile in our case the latter is is happening we have um, 75 megahertz on 2.3 for ddd um, in place which is nice if you do carrier aggregation i'm currently running over a cut 12 uh, which gives me an easy downlink of 100 mbps uh, uplink about 10 to 15 so that's a comfortable situation that the delays that I'm seeing in terms of the ping are around, uh, I would say, 13, 14 milliseconds. So if you have that kind of an infrastructure in place, uh, and we have this uh, pretty much uh, across the country in terms of household coverage, uh, fairly large, like uh, about 70 percent. So there isn't really a huge uh, like shortage in terms of having a good fixed wireless proposition. Um, uh, but if you don't have that position, obviously, there's a there's a there's a further need to really accelerate on the 
um, um, on the 5G. In terms of the traffic change, uh, uh, Amy, that you were asking, clearly what we all see is a, is, is a, a fairly dramatic, depends on the lockdown situation, but a fairly dramatic shift of the traffic uh, location from the office, obviously, to the residential. That's a, that's a very interesting thing and has led our network teams uh, uh, to become a bit busy in terms of making sure that the capacity is also provisioned well. We see um, an interesting shift from uh, the peaks that we had morning and evening to much more used during the day, which is very healthy for all our networks to make sure that we have a better utilization overall. Um, and we see also that the increase on the fixed uh, as compared to the mobile, even if it's fixed wireless, is, is more pronounced even than the mobile side. People are spending uh, the time on, um, on their fixed wireless uh, or fixed fiber network. And um, for those countries who have a full flat rate, uh, there's less of an upside for those countries who have uh, penetration and um, plans that are not yet unlimited. There's a good upside coming from, uh, from this one. In terms of the uh, customer quality, I think what we all need to do is that we are looking at the uh, actual delivered experience, especially on video. So we are looking very much uh, on a, on, on a, uh, across the day and across the customer base, what's the delivered uh, resolution uh, in terms of the actual delivered video. And uh, that has to go into obviously a capacity uh, adjustment uh, very much uh, just in time, we call it. So wherever we see the bottlenecks, then we would provision uh, the capacity um, and there's analytics quite key. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that everyone should be looking at, and I'm sure maybe you do, is the, what we call tra traffic and smart traffic management, uh, because uh, not all packets are equal uh, uh, necessarily, it depends on your local net neutrality, uh, of course, as well. But if you have uh, a traffic that is uh, basically compressible and you have a traffic that is uncompressible, the traffic management plays a big role in terms of the QCI mm -hmm. and the way how smartly you make sure that the monetized traffic is actually optimized in, in your network. So um, last point maybe here is there are innovative uh, uh, products that I think everyone can look at. For example, we see um, flat rates on specific video services quite successful. We have launched a YouTube flat, flat rate, which uh, allows you to do a, like a 24-7 streaming on youtube uh, and you just pay um you just pay a single uh, like a two dollar fee for the whole month um I so so i think if the network is done smartly uh you can come in terms of the price per gb down I, last point amy if you allow just <laughs> now the, uh, the, the uk, uh, UK um, report came out which looks across 230 countries globally in terms of the uh, price per gb i would recommend everyone to look into this one and uh, Sri Lanka last year was number seven cheapest in the world. Uh, now we are number eight cheapest in the world. So pretty much on the top 10 out of 230 countries with about 50 cents per GB. So that shows that using a TDD or an FDD 4G network, you can be fairly uh, effective and efficient in terms of deploying the capacity if you do it right. So that should be a benchmark. So it should be far below a dollar per GB for each and everyone uh, in, in the world. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Lots of detail, lots to think about again. So I think that we're gonna we're gonna move on now because we've still got lots lots more to to cover. Andrew, do you want to do a quick overview of this part of the? I'm gonna be super quick. Um, so the top half, the top four are looking at verticals. The bottom four are looking at uh, services. And what you can see is pretty much everything is on the right. Uh, so everybody's everybody's very optimistic about enterprise, particularly digital health, conferencing, and security. Now, again, you think, I think that would be reasonably evident and you know, most of it's kind of think, yeah, we can see the logic for that. I think also this calls a bit into question though, you know, what do, what do the bars really mean? Because one of the things we don't know, or at least I don't know, uh, Rhino probably knows, but you're certainly not gonna tell us and other people uh, on this call mm -hmm. may know too, is what is the impact you're seeing on the revenues and the profits in, in the field? So to a degree where the zero line exists here is is rather arbitrary so we're saying everything's going to be great and maybe retail and IoT is a bit slowed down well, no that isn't really the case because actually you're going to need to do a load of stuff in retail uh, to help the place recover and they're going to have some big needs of it but the industry may be behind you know where it needs to be and likewise um, manufacturing is going to need it because you need automation in manufacturing you're going to need to do that stuff so um, I think there's probably a little bit of over optimism but I think the the trend is about right here, um, and I think there's the, the the areas are reasonably obvious. I'm not sure we want to say too much more about that, Amy, in the interest of time, with one exception, which kind of relates to the next chart, which is about consumer, because I think one of the big things that's changing is that consumer and enterprise are merging. 
you know, the way that Rhino was talking about the traffic and the way that it was happening, and I've heard this from more than one um, person, in, you know, very senior in the marketplace is saying, we really have to think about the consumer as the same as the enterprise market now. It's not different. And it's likely to continue to be in some way like that for some time, if not in the long term. And I think that's one of the big things that comes out of it. And again, you can see in the consumer services side, you're seeing a massive, massive weight towards the right um, optimism because, um, you know, consumers need stuff and consumers enterprise. But I'm also seeing comments coming in saying, yeah, but there's no more ARPU for us to be had here. So really, are we going to stick a load more investment in this or not? And I think that's an argument that you're going to see played out. So I, th I think the trend in a way reflects use and interest. It doesn't necessarily reflect money. But I think uh, uh, if you're you know, looking at what Rhino would say about what he's doing for his customers, clearly he's putting in office around this. Security has really come out strongly in this in, in, in the consumer field, actually. That really came out uh, and, and blew me away, actually, because of the, the, the strength of opinion in that. So, uh, and, uh, Andrew, maybe one of the, the things to, to sort of ask uh, Sikanta and, and Rhino is, is their views on where this is a telco advantage and where this is other companies. Because I have to say, on things like conferencing, Clearly, the Zooms and the Microsofts have done very well out of this. I haven't had a single webinar or conference call on something that is obviously a telco platform in the last month. I don't know if anyone else has. But that's that's the sort of area where I'm not sure that that's a telco benefit rather than a tech industry more broadly. Uh, if you look into the the telcos, just uh, in addition to become digital service provider, it is a big becoming digital service enabler. So if you look into particular the industry segment, more and more automation improve in the productivity, the improving the time to repair in the maintenance kind of things, and in improving the training of the employees in the industry that becoming more and more needed so if you look into let's look into the industry side so one is the preventive maintenance how you enable preventive maintenance rather than reactive maintenance and those kind of stuff will be definitely used like ai and machine learning those kind of things will be applicable to come with a predictive maintenance of the uh, in the sub floor so that you can productivity will be higher and to enable those platform, uh, you need underlying communication infrastructure like 5G, high-speed connectivity, those kind of things. Another example of the uh, industry will be how we can use the AR, VR can very effectively use for the maintenance. People don't have to know everything using directly in the AR, VR and extended reality. They can do the maintenance very easily. But these are the kinds of platform. But to enable those platform, we need a communication infrastructure like 5G. It will be helpful for much. And another consumer side, if you look if into could, the education services. Sukanta, if I just can jump in there. I mean, I think what's really interesting is that the 5G enables these AR, VR solutions. And some of them will be used internally for the telco, as Reiner was saying, you know, monitoring uh, network equipment with drones and, and video surveillance and stuff. I think part of the part of what we're trying to understand here is can telcos also offer that as a solution to their enterprise customers, or exactly. is that is that a viable opportunity for telcos, or how much of that opportunity can they capture? Yeah, that's that's a that's what I was saying. Like that's a viable opportunity, and this is a really not just a communication infrastructure. Uh, Provide the telco will be more providing the service enabler, like so we can provide the platform and services using those kind of things in addition to communication service or connectivity service provider. And if you look into, let's look into the education service, which is very fundamentally, there is a fundamental paradigm shift in education sector for like training and education, those kind of things. What we see in the COVID-19, many of the classroom people are doing from the home. And if you look into it, mm -hmm. it is not just a communication service 
providing a fundamental connectivity, but the application running on top of those connectivity enable the people to have right uh, uh, kind of a, a proper learning, proper uh, those kind of things. So if you look into the, the whatever the video conferencing are doing, but if you do like AR, VR and extend reality application on top of the connectivity to support those kind of applications, that could be a very effective mm -hmm. training and uh, kind of a teaching methodology provide a platform and underlying communication infrastructure, mm. and it could be a global phenomena. It's not just like a specific to country, particularly in higher education. Uh, this should be a global phenomena just to provide mm. platform as well as the connectivity. Okay, so I think that we, thank you for, for those ideas. I think that what we're gonna do is we're gonna have to move on a little bit um, because we wanna have time for questions from everybody. So I think if we just, um, can do a final discussion, Andrew, on this uh, on this part of the survey. Yeah, um, I'm not, I think probably we, we don't have time for discussion. I mean, what this this shows is that we, the, there is a widespread view that innovation and understanding market needs are important. My cynicism, if you like, or skepticism might be a better word, is is to say, well, that's encouraging. I'm glad to hear that, but is it real? Um, because I sort of feel that. There's always a risk in telecoms that we just get, you know, if you hear the last conversation, you know, there's always a risk to say, well, you actually don't really own any of the services. You're not really doing any of the useful stuff. All you can do is enhance the communication and the enablement. And that's fine, but it leads you to a certain business model. So my kind of view on this is to say, great, I hope this is true, but I'm not sure whether it is or it isn't. And it's rather short term to imagine that this will sort of, that it has yet created a ground shift. Um, in in the way that telcos think about understanding needs, really talking to customers and, and moving that forward. Um, the other thing that this chart says, by the way, I wouldn't read anything into sustainability. It's just that a lot of people say we don't think it will change. The one area that there was an area that was, it thought would might be pushed down a bit was recruitment. But a lot of the comments here are not about, you know, actually saying, well, actually the important things we're still going to recruit. It's more general recruitment that we'll go and hold it right now. So I think we should move forward. I just wanted to put a bit of commentary around that. I'm sorry, Rainer and Sukhan, I haven't given you a chance to respond to that. And I've, I've put words in the mouths of telcos there, but I think in the interest of time, that's the best thing to do. So it doesn't represent your opinion. That's okay. So I will now um, open up. Uh, yes. Do you allow me? Uh, I'm not sure if you yes, allow me. Yes, please, please go ahead. Well, I process some of the questions. Because I'll let you a, have your piece. <laughs> that's one of the key one of the key discussions in terms of like um, what's the contribution as uh, digital telco providers we can we can add to the uh, consumer and enterprise uh, benefit. And I do think um, uh, that there is uh, quite some uh, innovation uh, according to your chart, uh, Andrew, as well and quite some customer understanding we can put into uh, the kitty. And like, let me give you at least a couple of just pointers. One is, for example, the pure connectivity at home. Now, as we see, uh, having a, a home office, having a family and having a study situation, uh, how, how would it be if we, have a, if we have a router which actually caters uh, to those needs in a separated way? So I can have my private uh, connection that I pay I have my business uh, line basically on the same router, on the same, uh, you know, either fiber or fixed wireless uh, SIM, which is paid by the uh, employee. And I have maybe a, a third uh, SSID, which is the one that I use for my kids. And each of those has different policies. Each of those has different securities and each of those is secured my kids. I want to basically uh, not allow an open internet access. So I do a whitelisting. My employer might have some policies that I uh, I would have to adhere to. For example, he doesn't like me to, you know, go on uh, on on social media during the daytime, so that can be managed. And my private life is my private life. I can do it on my own. So that's one example uh, which I think uh, we can add a lot of value, so that people can have a, a work and a study from home in a very convenient way. I don't have to invent a learning management system myself, but I can support. I can add a flat rate uh, into this one as well, unless you're already all on flat, but there can be a learning management system flat rate. There can be an Office 365 flat rate, right? These are all things that, for example, we have done so that you, you get the peace of mind of the customer to work and to basically study from home without having uh, to worry about some of the things like security, some of the things like build shock and some of the things like how easily can I manage my, my connectivity across my family and my, um, my business life. 
So just to, yeah. in terms of like, yeah. um, uh, I, th I think question. what I, what I buy oh. is, Rona, that the, uh, the operators, and you've done clearly a brilliant, you know, what you've outlined here is a really good idea, a series of really good ideas. And I think operators are very good at, um, or, or much better at, applying innovation around the existing services. And that's that's natural because it's what you have to hand. I think my point is, I'm not yet convinced that we're seeing operators going further than that and really understanding, say, looking at, um, you know, when you go to something a lot more challenging, looking at healthcare and looking at, say, an education. I mean, so I can't make some examples, uh, but also retail, a sector that is an absolute disaster at the moment. Um, I'm not sure yet that telcos are really kind of getting their heads around how you really help these sectors, and maybe they won't. Uh, I don't know. So I suppose my, my points were really not about you guys don't do it. I think it's the, the ambition and the scope in which you're approaching it. So my, my apologies, I wasn't trying to be mean to you, but it was great. You came up with some fantastic examples. So I'm glad I provoked you. But <laughs> um, Amy, back to you. Well, I think that um, I just realized that we haven't given Dean a chance to talk about his long term scenarios. So I think I hand over to him for a couple of minutes because um, a lot of the questions that were coming through are, are ones that we have have since covered, but I'll say I'll hand over to you, Dean, for a couple of minutes and okay. come back to the panel with some questions at the very end. I'll have a couple of couple of minutes. OK, so one of the things in the full report, which you can download, Amy will send you a link after the call, is I've got a number of long term scenarios. And we all hear people talking about the new normal and there's others who are sort of perhaps more dystopian. So what we've got in the report is we set out four views almost looking back from 2025. These are not forecasts. These are for scenario planning purposes. And you know, the, the outcome is likely to be some hybrid of these. But they're a good thought experiment. And we look at them on the axis of, you know, one level is is just you know, what's the medical side of this? You know, do we manage to deal with the uh, the virus or is it with us in perpetuity? Um, and I think that there's a couple of different scenarios you can paint there depending on your optimism. And the other one is where, is the level to which we see national markets um, collaborate um, and within that the telecoms industry collaborating versus increasing levels of isolation and um, you know, country specific um, uh, approaches to business and to the economy. And at the moment, um, my view is that if I had to, I, I really hesitate to put um, probabilities on these because they're scenarios rather than forecasts, is that we're somewhere between the two that we call uh, back to almost normal and fragmented. Um, so that's this sort of the not unrealistically optimistic but not dystopian either we're back to almost normal this is in 2025 we've got back to having a, a relatively normal social life relatively normal travel life um you know we're going to have more iot more disinfecting robots in our restaurants and, and non-viral surfaces and so forth but it doesn't look too different from 2019 Fragmented recovery is a scenario where different parts of the world um, recover at different paces. We have some economic and political turmoil in certain uh, locations, perhaps a move to authoritarianism in others. Um, trade is less than it was, and a lot of countries are really focused on self-sufficiency, whether that's around medical PPE or whether that's around uh, logistics and supply chain management. Um, and then we've got the sort of the more positive and negative scenarios where stronger than before is, is more the sort of glass half full. You know, we take all the lessons from this. We uh, set everything up to combat climate change as all the companies recover. We um, essentially uh, work collaboratively as a global society more. Um, yeah, that's the, the sort of the, the, the rose tinted view of the future. And then the weak and distant one is the opposite to that, where we still have to deal with the virus. Um, we haven't got a vaccine. We still spend an awful lot of time in isolation and at home. Um, there's perhaps less collaboration between countries because everyone has their own problems stemming both from the medical side, but also the economic fallout um, from the next uh, year to 18 months. Um, in the report, I go through into each of these in a lot more detail. This is this slide, which uh, looks very pretty, but I certainly don't have time to talk through now, where against about 10 different categories, we look at what that each of those scenarios might mean, whether it's on 5G, whether it's on consumer enterprise services, um, where regulation might go, which is an important thing here. And then what we call the coordination age within STL of how telecoms can actually improve the world. Uh, and help to manage resources. But I'll leave that one for, for exercise for the reader. 
What I will uh, just quickly highlight, though, are some um, some indicators of what might the signs be to watch out in the medium term, which give us steer on where we go long term. And we've categorized these into positive and negative. And the medical ones are fairly self-explanatory. Ones I want to focus on are further down this, sli this slide on the government and telecom uh, actions uh, regulatory. So there's certain things that I've already mentioned where, you know, frankly, it's not good if we see continued um, release, slow releases of spectrum. I had uh, on a number of calls, I'm, I'm doing one tomorrow, about what's the, the response to government in, in terms of releasing extra bands or delaying stuff. I think what would be good is if we see a relaxation of things like planning rules, uh, whether that's around siting of uh, mobile networks or even just digging up the road and getting way leaves for putting in fiber. Uh, I think one of the other things to watch for, and this is perhaps a topic for another uh, webinar, is smart cities and smart buildings. Um, I think that we're going to get to a position in a couple of years time where a lot of countries have what I will call pandemic proof building codes in much the same way they do have fire codes today or even earthquake proof in certain parts of the world where maybe if there's another outbreak the government um, can say this building has to go from a capacity of a thousand people to 300 people and we want to have sensors that look for occupancy um, so that all of the meeting rooms have a um, minimum two meter spacing between people perhaps we're using uh, motion detection we've got one-way systems around the corridors and and uh, staircases and if you haven't got those the building has to close and i think that the telecoms industry and also a bunch of adjacent sectors like the um, smart building and uh, in building wireless companies and potentially the wi-fi industry has a lot to play in that type of scenario and something similar i expect to see at a smart city level um, you know, for example, around uh, monitoring public transit, uh, transit and transport for perhaps uh, scheduling uh, disinfection in certain areas, um, obviously enabling public safety and security. And then there's all the stuff around the uh, tracking and tracing apps, which you know, we might not see as a permanent feature, but I think we'll see governments want to be able to switch those on. Uh, in emergencies in the same way that we see for, for other emergency scenarios, whether it's an earthquake or tsunami or fire or anything else. So I'll leave the rest of that for, for as an exercise for the reader and pass back to Amy. So I think that oh, I, I want to finish with a question that I've had in a couple of different guises and brings up a, a topic that we've kind of skirted around, um, which is the idea of digital transformation. Uh, sorry, Dean. In uh, telecoms operators and you know we've had lots of chat about automating network operations and how that's important and you know understanding the customer better and um you know using online channels more but on our chart which shows that um sorry we'll just go back so we can see we've had a few questions saying you know digital transformation programs are getting a broad positive angle here but usually those are very costly to do they're difficult, big projects to implement. So um, our, our, our listeners want to know, do you really, in your perspective, do you see appetite for pushing through big digital transformation programs or is it more a question of building on what, what you already have? Shall I start, Amy? Yeah, so the, uh, I, I would disagree with the statement of this being costly. Um, if we look at our business, uh, anything between, uh, I would say, 12, 15 to 25 percent um, of our revenue goes back into network CAPEX or into CAPEX overall, which is mainly uh, the network in terms of the run. And then there will be a bit of transport and core, but mainly we are talking about a, a CAPEX industry here. If I look at the digital transformation, um, it is uh, far, far from these numbers and the value that we are getting from uh, automation, the value we are getting from, um, like I was explaining, the front office, the back office, uh, digitization, the simplification of the processes and ha having a customer uh, to enable him for self-care rather than for assisted, the value is, 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 is much, much larger. These things don't come overnight, so I don't think anyone would now quickly hassle into a digital transformation program just because of COVID. I, I don't think that anyone will do and it might not be a, a great idea, but what it certainly shows is that any work that has been done earlier 
uh, pays off uh, even maybe faster than we anticipated. And like I said, uh, the customer and some of the stakeholders in the system might be adopting some of the tools and processes uh, that we have prepared in the past 10, 12, 24 months faster because of the, the need of the hour. Uh, and uh, last point, if I look at the real uh, uh, value uh, comes when I'm adding uh, analytics to the equation. So the automation and the digitization is actually only the first step in terms of creating value from, uh, from, from, from digitization. Uh, the real value comes when I'm now uh, getting uh, an integrated data lake, when I'm getting uh, like a cloud-based, ideally a cloud-based analytics infrastructure, when I'm augmenting my organization with uh, what we call analytics at the edge. So everyone in the organization actually embracing uh, insights and data rather than having to rely on a, on a central team. So that's, I think, the point in time when you really see the value coming back. And I don't think we should be too worried about uh, the investment going into digital transformation analytics. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, guys, I'm very sorry that I was not a harsher moderator and did, did not <laughs> interrupt people enough to get through more questions. I know that um, we have many more questions from our attendees, which I will share with our panelists. And we will put into a, a Q&A PDF, which we will make available uh, sometime next week for everyone. So apologies that I missed most of your questions. Thank you very much to all our panelists for joining us today. It's been a great session. We've learned a lot. And um, you know, please do share the, the survey with everyone because we'd love to get more responses and, and share those um, as we go along. So thank, you, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.